Hello, I'm Teresa McKee, your host for A Mindful Moment. Thank you for joining me as we explore ways to increase mindfulness in our day-to-day experiences through weekly topics, expert interviews, and guided mindfulness meditations. Mindfulness is presence, awareness. It's paying attention to what's happening within us and around us. Mindfulness increases our emotional, physical, and mental well-being. It can also enhance our focus and productivity. Perhaps most importantly in today's uncertain world, mindfulness strengthens our ability to be more compassionate toward ourselves as well as others. Marco spent her formative years working at well-known advertising agencies in New York City. Over many late nights, Angela helped in creating on-brand effective work across all mediums, gaining invaluable experience working with huge national products. Years later, the pandemic led her back to her passion of wanting to help the little guy by making guidance accessible to those who long to rediscover themselves. And today, we'll talk about her journey from 25 years as a creative marketing director to founder of finduniquelyyou.com and co-founder and chief creative officer of Phenom Publishing. We'll also talk about her new book, Uniquely You, update number 52, The Birth of a Bright-Eyed Entrepreneur. Welcome, Angela. Oh my gosh, that was so cool. I'm like, who is she talking about? That person sounds amazing. (laughs) She is. (laughs) How are you today? I am really good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. And I thought after reading the book and, and, you know, reading about your journey, I thought a good place to start for our listeners might be to talk about there's so many people changing jobs or careers right now. And I think a lot of them are struggling with like what direction to take. Mm -hmm. So what prompted you to make the transition from marketing executive to entrepreneur? Oh, okay. So I am, I've been a career creative my whole life. I'm not a business person. Um, I've always been, I've always been handed the data and made beautiful things with it for my clients. It was never my lifelong passion to create a business. So this is like, it kind of came out of nowhere. Um, back in 2008, like, let's just like step back when am I like around the last my last agency job, Uh, We were in the recession. I was going through a horrific divorce. I had a almost three year old. Um, It was it was it was probably like the darkest time of my life. But I uh, met some good people. I connected and eventually I started doing like a freelance business. And that was the part where I really enjoyed helping the little guy taking all this corporate experience I had to help little people. So I built myself up, but I didn't have anybody at the time. No one to teach me how to freelance with a kid, how to schedule the time. Like I just had no one to really talk to at the time. So around um, the pandemic, around 2020 in November, I started to see that in other people, that that loneliness, that fear, that, you know, wanting to switch, wanting to do something different. You know, either people were losing their jobs because they weren't getting vaccinated or they, you know, had to be on site and they were scared. Like it's just, you know, everybody was rethinking it. And, um, and then the idea for uniquely you just kind of like plopped in my brain. So I was like working on it for like a year. And then in September of 2021, I had the idea, I had the full-time job, six figures as a director of marketing for a manufacturing company. Great job. Great people. Um, no reason. I was happy. <laughs> it was a good job. Um, but in September of 2021, my town had, uh, some, some tragedies. So the kids were just getting back to school, the masking and the vex and all that stuff was going on. And then my daughter's friend, um, a ninth grader killed himself. And, and then there was just like another tragedy that happened, another tragedy. I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't do this manufacturing job. I have to bring this business to life because people need help. They need positivity. They need a reason and a place to go where they cannot feel uplifted. Everything was so dark and heavy. So um, my husband and I bought a very expensive house and two weeks later I turned to him and I'm like, you know, I have to quit, right? (laughs) And he was like, "Uh," (laughs) 
And, you know, I was like, I promise we'll be making money in six months, you know, yada, 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 a year and a half later, here we are <laughs> trying to buy bananas. But yeah, that was really the catalyst was uh, societal. Like I felt like I had no choice. Wow. Well, you mentioned fear. And I think that's the biggest and most common barrier to people who really want to change, but that fear just holds them back. They can't really, I don't know, figure out how to get past that sort of barrier. And you did. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you have any ideas or tips that you can share with people about where do you find that courage or to take that leap or, you know, how did you uncover it? Cause we probably all have it. Right. But yeah. what did you do? How did you get over the fear of like quitting your job when you just bought a house? Oh, well, I didn't have fear about that. My husband did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I got this. No, I, um, quite honestly, it, it, having a person, that's the most important thing. I had a person that I can talk to that was like, basically like, you can't fail. And she became like my inner voice, right? Anytime I got worried. Um, but not all of us have a person. So, you know, I, my advice for anybody who is thinking about it is just start looking and looking at the options and looking at the things. You don't have to make any decisions. If you go at it with like, it's like, it's fun, like fact finding of what you could do then all of a sudden the, the, the need, the want, the desire, just like I was working on the business for a year, you know, and then all of a sudden the need to desire overcame the fear. So if you just start looking, start dabbling, start dating with, you know, job boards <laughs> or what you would do if you had the time, like what would your ideal life look like? Then, you know, watch it come to fruition. I think. That's funny because that is my advice I give to my leadership coaching clients when they're disgusted with their jobs and they think they can't stand it one more day. And I'll say, you know, don't quit. Don't, don't do anything. Just start looking, see what's out there. And it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> so it's interesting that it, it solves two problems, but it does, it changes the, the focus of your brain, you know, whether it's fear or whether it's dread or any negative emotion, when you start recognizing the abundance of everything available, you feel better. And then, then your desires can come up instead of it being tamped down by those concerns. Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. And also um, understanding that you're worthy of being happy. You know, for some reason, we think we have to stay in the job because we're so, because of, of all these things. No, we are worthy of feeling happy and joy. Why should somebody else feel happy and joy? We can feel, we can, we can do this. You can just do this and feel happy every day. And then everybody around you is happy. You know, the, what's that, what's that saying? Make mom happy. The whole house is happy. <laughs> yeah. Happy wife, happy life. I think. Too, yes. <laughs> no, so true. Well, the book and find uniquely you.com aren't just about careers. I want to make that clear, but it's, it includes inner growth. It's about enhancing awareness. It's about connections and relationships. And so I'm wondering if you can share with our listeners what Uniquely You is and what it offers so they have more context about what we're going to be talking about. Oh, that's great. Okay. So Uniquely You is a platform, an online learning platform for content creators and authors to take their work to another dimension and really connect with their audience through live intimate workshops. So um, we teach you, we have a free training program. It's human to human. We don't have a self-paced, you know, to do it yourself. We do all the technology, all the administration. You come in, you have meetings just like this with, and you work through a syllabus. Dana has a whole program that she's designed. Um, and then you take your content and you create a workshop out of it. So you can monetize that, but you can really spend like 20 people talking about the stuff that you love best. And it's just, so we created that and it's based around seven schools of thought. So we've got empowerment, metaphysics. Um, it takes a village, parenting, things like that. All of our workshops and our content is really around um, personal empowerment. So users of the platform would come in because they would get to connect with people that they aspire to. Like if someone wanted to hang out with you because they're like, oh my God, you're so amazing. But maybe they couldn't afford a one-on-one -on -one with you. They would be able to take a, a, a workshop with you in a small group and they would make friends and like-mindedness and magic happens in those, in those virtual rooms. It's really beautiful. So that's really what Uniquely You is about in a nutshell. Fantastic. 
All right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the book. Um, first of all, why did you just decide to write the book when you were very busy setting up a new company? Um, and secondly, what gave you the idea to tell the story through the emails you sent out sharing the progress of the startup? Oh my goodness. So I, I didn't write the emails with the intention of, of writing a book, right? You know, I, I start, so I came up with the idea in November, 2020. By January 2021, that's when the email started. I had a, a small group of friends, like 20 people that were just on board for the ride, you know, like hanging out, helping me out. And so part of me was like, man, I'm just going to connect with them. I want to keep this. I wanted to create a community. I needed a community at that time. So I wanted to foster this community. So it started out with me sharing like progress of the business to help me stay accountable. And I started sending them every week. And then when there wasn't a lot of progress, I started to, like, okay, so this happened or like this happened with my family or this happened with my kids. And I started just sharing really personal developments. And those beginning emails are so annoying to me. Like I look, I'm like, oh, cause I'm like, go guys. And I was like, I made so many rookie mistakes. So anybody who's reading this, I'm an entrepreneur who made all the mistakes, <laughs> all the mistakes and they're all in this book. Um, but then I, my personal development is really what it's about because I go, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm honest. I show, I, I, my son had a seizure and it was terrifying. And I talk about that experience. Um, I talk about the miscarriage I had, like, I just am a full open book. And eventually my, the emails went out from 20 people to 250. And so these random people all the way up to our launch date, when I said, okay, guys, this is going to stop now because I'm not going to be an open book for the randos out there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. And then, so Dana and I started this publishing company. Dana Sardano is my, my partner and co-founder. Um, we started Phenom Publishing and we put her books through and I was like, you know, I think I want to compile the emails into a book. And she was like, yeah, let's do it. So there you go. Fantastic. Well, it was a great way to follow your journey. And I am going to ask you a little bit more about those beginning emails in a minute. <laughs> <Okay>. uh. <laughs> Nothing terrible. But I, I do want to say you do share in the book some of your own practices too that you developed that you found or discovered along the way, like sitting quietly in the morning when you first wake up. Yeah. Um, I love the, you know, that you discovered repeating a mantra of letting go of things that no longer served you. Um, and you also talk about the importance of self-love and self-care. And so all of those are really components of mindfulness. And I'm wondering um, if you could share, I don't know, basically how you think mindfulness practices either helped you or how they can help someone else who's going through a major transition and also when adversity hits. Ah, yes, of course. Okay. So my, uh, I, I was yelled at by like the people that loved me, you know? You need to sit in quiet because I would, I, my mind all over the place all the time. And when they're, when you're in that harried state, everything becomes harried, right? All the work, everything that we do. So I, I, I made it a practice to sit. I'm not a meditator. I'm not an own person. No offense to anybody who is, I just can't, it's not my thing. Right. Um, but I would sit with my coffee because my coffee is my morning coffee with the right oat milk creamer. Oh, there's nothing like it. So I found my spot. I get everybody out of the house and I sit down with my coffee and I just let my mind be quiet because it allows me to settle in and say, okay, what's the priority for the day? What do I need to focus on? What can wait? You know, like, what do I need to get off my plate? So just going through those motions really, really helped me kind of like listen to my inner voice because not everything has to be done right now. And as Dan, and my friend Dana always says, uh, eat all the candy, right? You know, put some in your pocket. Maybe say you don't like that one over there, you know, like to sort the candy is basically what that moment is. And um, when I am in a moment of adversity, so I have a four-year-old, even the, let's take this morning for a moment. We had a, an argument as I'm taking him out of the car <laughs> to go into daycare. And he, um, I, I, he sat down on the bottom of the floor of the truck. And I kind of closed the door a little bit and we both had to take a minute. And when we both took a minute, I realized, okay, that was escalated. We're going to de-escalate this moment and just breathe. And then I opened the door and I put my hand out to him. And we say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I love you. I love you. I love you. And then he cries because he feels bad, you know, but that's like just learning to take those pauses helps me so much. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and this leads back to your emails, um, the, the self-awareness component that continues to develop 
the more you practice. So what you're describing are still mindfulness techniques. It's where you're taking a pause. It's where you're checking in. It's where you're, you know, stopping to think before you do something, uh, even if it's just what you're going to say. And you shared that, you know, you were like somewhat horrified about your the early, the early time emails, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because you were so optimistic, which I, I found inspirational, but, um, okay. <laughs> but, but what I, but what, I don't know, what really defined for me that how, how much you had grown over that, the course of the, of the year was that you went back and reflected, right? So in hindsight, you, you reflected on what was really going on internally back at the beginning of that year. And I think that that's really important because, you know, we spend so much time judging ourselves, beating ourselves up, criticizing ourselves, all these terrible things that we do to ourselves that we would never do to other people. Yeah. Um, but when you can look back and realize like, oh, you know, I was in pain in that moment. And, and that's, you know, that was really me trying to, you know, project the positivity, but I wasn't really feeling it yet internally. And then you can see toward the end, now, now you're in alignment. Like, yeah. would you agree with that? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, I was one of my behavior patterns was putting on a mask and pretending everything's fine and always looking at the bright side everything's bright everything's rosy and then it went regardless of what I felt inside because I was I wasn't connected to what I felt inside and I didn't realize how the the things that I was feeling the 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 angst the fear I wasn't realizing how it was coming across as I didn't I wasn't aware so really it is that self-awareness that that has like now I'm comfortable in my skin. Now I can say, I'm having a bad freaking day, you know, like it is what it is. And no one's judging me for it because I don't care. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, <yeah>, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you shared an incident where you fell off your bicycle. And oh, I broke my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Busted your butt, I think is what you wrote, but your insight after you fell off that bike about what serves you best in the moment uh, of not reacting immediately to life's events is such a great example of the importance of responding versus reacting. So how did that benefit you going forward after your bicycle incident? After my broke my butt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's definitely about that pause. It's that pause. I really needed to learn that pause. And I got that lesson a bunch of times. So that's, yeah, I, my first reaction. So I'm, I'm almost 13 years sober and I was in the fellowship of um, Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the sayings, the sayings that always run around in my brain is um, uh, drop the pen, you know, put, put down the pen, you know, like, it's just like, stop, like, so restra restraint of pen and tongue. <laughs> so my first reaction through my whole life was what came out. And then once I learned to, mm, don't do the first thought, Mm -hmm. you know oh okay there's a better way <laughs> yeah. you know I we don't give our minds time to catch up with what's happening and so I think it's so important and I do the pause thing all the time uh, once I learned that and then the other thing I learned was the same what you're talking about just be quiet and because I thought I was observing other people that I was really in touch with what's going on and I realized I was talking a lot to protect myself from having to really open up. So it was another, it was kind of a mask when I was younger. Yeah. And so when I discovered this whole new world of, oh, there's all this stuff going on, I didn't even know was happening in my mind and in my body and externally. And I went from the most talkative person in the room to just the observer. <laughs> like I went uh, from one extreme to the other okay. for a while. And yeah. it was such a good experience for me because it let me see like, oh, look at all I'm miss missing, but also if I'm always doing, talking, being busy, 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 I'm not checking in with myself either. And so that, that made a huge difference in my life to just learn to respond or to say, even in the middle of a, say a disagreement with someone to say, you know what, I need a couple of minutes to process, or I need a couple of minutes to think about this instead of just plowing through. Yes. And yeah, don't, and I think it just improves relationships so much because now you're an active listener and an authentic participant in the discussion. Yeah. Yes, totally. Because if you're thinking about the next thing you're going to say, then you think about the next thing you say, not what that person's saying. Right. right? right. And I have a, I have a friend who is just telling me how he's busy, 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 busy all the time. And I'm like, you need to sit in quiet. And he's like, why? That's boring. I'm like, no, you need to sit in quiet. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, you know, you're, you're certainly not uncommon to say like meditation is not your thing. And um, that's how I got into mindfulness meditation. 
um, I, I meditated in other ways, which I actually really enjoyed, but they're, they tend to be really time consuming. And so I, I'm busy, but I'm not doing busy work. Like I'm busy with things I'm passionate about and want to do. And it's very difficult for me to set aside an hour, you know, to do like a spiritual meditation. I think they're lovely, but I just, I know I don't have the time to do that regularly. And mindfulness meditation, you can take a walk and be doing a mindful meditation. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, oh, really, is that it, like, like just being aware and in the it's moment. about awareness. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So oh. like a walking meditation instead of what we normally do, which is, you know, the, the voice is just chattering away as we're walking, you slow down, you know, mentally, and then you just pay attention you, and you can choose. And that's the other lovely thing about it, but you can choose what you're going to focus on. So it could be how your feet feel at every point, like as your heel hits the ground, as your, you know, as it rolls and your toes hit the ground, or it could be, what's that pain in my knee? So you focus on that, <laughs> or it could be, you know, is my breathing the same or is it accelerate? So you're just focusing though on the experience. And that's really what mindfulness meditation is, is because it brings you to the present moment instead gotcha. of worrying so about the past. Do that. I can do that when I'm doing laundry. Yeah, exactly. You can do it with anything. Yeah. So it's yeah. really just paying acute attention and the, how you strengthen it is when your mind wanders, because it will, you're doing yeah. the laundry and you're, you know, I don't know, looking at your four-year-old's cute little outfit. And then suddenly you're thinking, oh, did I file that report? You know what I mean? Like you, you yeah. go off somewhere. Yeah. So the act of mindfulness is to be aware that you just did that and to bring yourself back to the cute little outfit you're folding of your sons. Oh, and so, great. yes, the more you Thank do it, you. you're welcome. Thank so you yes, it's not, that. it's not as arduous as, you know, the, you know, I mean, I know that they're, and I really, really, um, admire people that can sit like 10 days in meditation, which yes. they go to these retreats and that's all they do for 10. I can't do that either. I can sit for 20 minutes. Usually that's about my max. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> yeah. So there, there are ways to do this without it being, you know, uncomfortable. And I think especially for really, um, active people, active minds, like because my mind goes all the time too. I have to pause and get everything silent again. I do it multiple times a day for like two minutes. Yeah, so it's not, yeah. it's not, there's nothing, there's nothing abnormal about it. It's just, some people are just naturally calmer. And some of us are like, what else can I do? <laughs> so you I know. To I, my, my husband can sit there staring at the wall. I'm like, what do you think about it? It's like nothing. I'm like, how? <laughs> And that's another myth, by the way, is that meditation is where you uh, stop the thoughts from happening. Right. You can't stop the thoughts unless you, you've departed. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you're alive, the, the thoughts are going to come. So it's really yeah. just about noticing the thoughts. And once you start doing that, then, you know, a lot of the stuff that we, we were talking earlier that we went through earlier in life was, you know, kind of thinking we're on one path and then it all falls apart. And then you're trying to pick it back up. There's so much negative thinking that happens. And, um, once you practice mindfulness long enough, what you realize is the thoughts are meaningless, your conscious thoughts that you're trying to, to think like, Oh, how do I want to start this business? What am I going to do? You know, whatever things like that, yeah. th those are fine. It's the constant rattling that goes on where it's, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. You're, you're going to fail. That's the stuff that if you listen to it, it does stop you, but yeah. it's not real. It's just the ego looking for danger and sending you these bombardment of, you know, <laughs> negative, negative Nelly comments. And um, once you practice mindfulness meditation long enough, you recognize right away, oh, why am I thinking that? And you stop thinking that, but yeah. you're going to think, you know, other things and hopefully more positive things. <laughs> well, Teresa, I can just see why you have 2 million downloads on your freaking podcast. You're so amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. That's, that's just been such a strange journey <laughs> because we never set out to do a podcast. So yeah, it's been this just sort of labor of love and, but it just slowly keeps growing. So, you know, that makes me really happy that we're reaching people to help them be more mindful because as you started out this, this discussion, so many people deserve happiness, but they don't know how to get there. And it's much more an internal job than an external job. And I think once people realize that, then then they can seek out all the support and tools and everything that's out there. Mindfulness, what you have at um, uniquely you and, and those, those tools, and they really are tools or platforms or one thing that I love about what you're doing is it's not just uh, lessons or I don't know, or classes. It's not like the typical, it's not like, it's not like just reading a book you're creating uh, connections and relationships between people. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if you agree with this, but I think it's more important than ever now, because I think we've lost a lot of our previous connections over the three years of the ugh, pandemic and so far, but also um, a lot of people kind of 
pulled in. So mm -hmm. I, I know in our workshops, people are much less talkative, much less outgoing, same people that four years ago were very outgoing. Yeah. And so I think maybe we need these spaces that we can start to slowly reconnect again, even if it's online so that we can kind of rebuild our network of, like you said, you had someone behind you to help support you. I think yeah. we all need that and we can develop that. Absolutely. And, you know, we always say that we're bringing the humanity into an inhuman world, you know, with this online space, but it, being virtual like this, we can feel each other's energy and we can connect on a, on a soul level. And when you find people, because every we're, we're constantly changing as human beings, that's our job here to yeah. come, we come down, we evolve, or, you know, we do all this stuff. And so the same people, you know, I always look at people who have these, these friendships from childhood and I'm like, oh, that's amazing. So you guys grew together. You were able to do that. That's a gift, but it doesn't mean um, that it's, it's like the, the way it is. You know, I don't talk to my family anymore. We all kind of like outgrew each other really. And it just, it is what it is, but I accept it. But now I need to fill those buckets with people who are, are like me now. And that's what these spaces really provide. It's the okay, like the, the like-mindedness of going through something together or situations together and helping each other. And you go from being stranger to friend. I have friends all over the world. I've got friends in New Zealand, Australia. I and mean, it's amazing. It's amazing um, the connections we can make in these spaces. So, yeah. That's beautiful. And, and again, I just, I think it, 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 it not only, you know, supports you during something that you're going through, but it just enriches life. You've got all these different perspectives and different opinions and and I think that that helps us grow all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. So what, what do you hope people take away from the book? <sighs> that if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> now I have, um, I figured out stuff that I, I didn't know I could do. You know what I mean? Like I tested the limits I used. I, um, I never knew how to budget. I just didn't grow up knowing how to budget. I thought people just always had credit card debt. That's how I grew up. And my husband, when we met, I was like, yeah, I'll always have debt. He was like, no, you won't. <laughs> We're going to work on that. Um, but the things that I, I pushed myself to do and then finding the people that I connected with and and them helping me on the things that I couldn't. So, you know, really just having the courage because you never know. What is uh, Wayne Gretzky's? Do you miss 100% of the shots you don't take? That yeah. that. That's a good one, right? Because if you don't try, you'll never know. And I had to try. And if I fail, this journey has been phenomenal. So it's not about the completion. It's not about the end. It's not about the, I'll be making six figures and, and all that good stuff. It's just been an incredible experience for me personally. So just do it. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Tell fear to F the F off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and when we fail is when we learn the most, you know, and, and I am constantly teaching this, like, stop, stop worrying about failing that it, it's a, it's a lesson. Every time it's a lesson, it's a lesson. It's just going to propel you further. And the funny thing is we worry so much about it. And there's what difference does it make? <laughs> like if you fail at something, it's not like you can't just try something else. So I know, it's just getting I know. past our, I don't know, our egos, I guess, but yeah. And I do, I do believe that, um, energetically, like if I, like I'm on this path, so I was put with the people who are going to help me progress on this path. Yeah. So if you, if you start that focus, that's why in what we were talking about earlier, if you start just looking for the job or find like yeah. oh, that feels like that would be fun. All of a sudden things kind of align to get you there. So it's not so much of a jumping off a cliff without a parachute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh no. And, and I've experienced that my whole life. I, Start, you know, I start thinking about something and then an opportunity arises. So it absolutely yeah. works that way, which is a lovely way for the universe to work. Yeah, thank you, um, universe. <laughs> so how can our listeners find out more about uh, uh, finduniquelyyou.com and your book, Uniquely You, update number 50? I guess we should explain why it's update number 52. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's 52 emails. Um, I wrote them almost weekly, but it's over the course of a year and a half. And I, at one point I, when I was ready to prepare for launch, like when I left the job and was serious in it, I said, okay, guys, the next email, it was update 51. I said, the next one I write to you guys, I'm going to go on, I'm going in the basement for a couple months and I'm going to come out, pull my, my inner Steve jobs. <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, I was like, when I write this update to you guys, uh, that means it's go time. It's super, super exciting. So that the, I just wanted to kind of like give like a, a break. And then in between that, my son had a, a seizure where it, it was, it was the most horrific event of our lives. And 
so I had like a, a, a little break in there where I wrote the story about that and my experiences with that. And then, uh, and then, yeah, update 52. I was like, okay, next week we're going live. Thank you. This has been awesome. And just, you know, and then it was like, then I had to write the epilogue because so much happened between then and launch, like in that week. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so it's, been, um, so anybody you can find me, um, I would love to connect on LinkedIn. Like I'm a very personal person. Like I would love to really like make a connection. And if anybody says, I was like, saw you on Teresa's podcast, you know, like message me on LinkedIn and let's be, let's be friends. Um, I would love to consult if anybody, you know, just wants some any advice or take it further. Um, I also teach some workshops on branding and, um, how to build a website and stuff on the platform, um, just to help the little guy, you know? Um, but yeah, I just would love to make connections. So find me on LinkedIn. I think I'm Angela Marie Galaska Doran. Oh my God, DeMarco. I just went through all my last names. <laughs> I've been on LinkedIn for a while. Uh, I'll send you the link <laughs> or go to, yeah, we'll put it in the social media <laughs> or go, go to find uniquely you it's the letter you.com and, uh, see what we're all about. And you can always reach out to us there too. Wonderful. Well, it's been a delight speaking with you today. And I really appreciate you sharing your inspirational journey with our listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has been so great. You're lovely to talk to and you're so smart. Thank you so much. <laughs> Until next time, I encourage you to meditate daily and be mindful in all of your everyday activities. Simply bring your full awareness to the present moment to build your mindfulness skills, paying attention to every detail of what you're doing, from washing dishes to work tasks to taking a walk. Your mind will wander, and that's normal. Each time you notice it has wandered, that's mindfulness. Consider how wonderful the world could be if everyone was mindful. You can help make that happen. It all starts with a mindful moment. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to other great shows like the Daily Meditation Podcast, Everything Everywhere, and Movie Therapy. We deeply appreciate your support at patreon.com slash a mindful moment. Please be sure to subscribe to A Mindful Moment and follow us on Instagram at A Mindful Moment Podcast. Visit our website, amindfulmoment.com, to access podcasts, scripts, and book recommendations. A Mindful Moment is written and hosted by Teresa McKee and or Melissa Sims. The Spanish version is translated and hosted by Paola Tile. Intro music, Retreat by Jason Farnham. Outro music, Morning Stroll by Josh Kirsch, Media Right Productions. Thank you for tuning in. This podcast is produced by Work to Live Productions. <laughs>